Um, well, I don't know, I'm impressed. Just state, start by stating a basic fact, which is that uh, without plants, man couldn't live. Well, we know that, but something we don't always realize is that 90% uh, of our food needs are covered by only 20 plant species. And why not? But the thing is ah, that okay. uh, 80,000 yeah. wild okay. plants have been recognized as being edible throughout the world. All these plants have been used by man, yeah, no, and the thing that. is that now they are pretty much all but forgotten. And this is strange. Thank you. Why? Is it because yeah, they don't taste good, or is it because they are not efficient as food? I don't believe so. I think it's based mostly on historical reasons. One has to do with agriculture, and what Stefano said earlier is very interesting. Um, very few plants are domesticated, but maybe it's because not so many plants wanted to be domesticated. I don't know, but the fact is that for a long time, man has been um, gathering plants as long as cultivating, but now it's not, it's not true anymore. And um, I think something very important happened in the Middle Ages, which is that our society was divided into two very unequal parts. And um, um, the upper crust was nobility and clergy and uh, rich people, and they had to differentiate themselves from the mass of people by way of habitat, of um, language, of clothes, you know, they had the right to have bright colored clothes, which the peasants didn't have the right to, and food. And as far as food goes, they would eat meat, a lot of meat, and refined products, including sugar, um, which first came as a medicine. And as far as fruits and vegetables go, um, they would use the plant, I mean, the in thing to do was to eat the plants that were brought back from all over the world by the expeditions that they would launch, because it was a sign of a high social status. If you could eat something that was grown by somebody else that you could pay, whereas the peasants, um, they didn't eat a lot of meat, it was unrefined products, and um, as far as plants, you know, they would have to eat easy to grow vegetables and wild plants, because wild plants are given for free by nature. So wild plants because became a sign of a low social status. And it's become even more true when peasants came to the city, became workers, and wanted to adopt the bourgeois way of life, which was based on the court way of life and way of eating. So nowadays, basically what we're eating is um, something which proves that we have a high social status, and wild plants are definitely out of the picture because of that. And I think it's too bad because oh. we've lost myriads of different tastes, for one thing, and also wild plants have tremendous nutritional value. Actually, man evolved eating wild plants. It's our normal food. This is something that brings us everything that we need, all the nutrients we need. I'll take just the example of nettles. Nettles have about seven times more vitamin C than oranges. They have as much calcium as cheese. They have um, three times more iron than spinach. And they have proteins, as, m as, many, as, many, as much protein as soybeans, except that these are uh, balanced in essential amino acids. Um, Maybe it wouldn't be not too serious because we can live, we can definitely live without eating wild plants. We could live by eating only cultivated plants and other foods. But one thing that we cannot avoid um, facing now is that our society has created huge problems. And I think these problems actually come from our separation from nature, which I put all this in a nutshell, you know, it would take us a long time to discuss it, but basically the big fracture 
um, happened 10,000 years ago with the beginning of agriculture and everything that it had to bring and that it did bring us, which is not only nice things. So I believe if we want to be realistic and act realistically, um, we have to change our point of view and acknowledging the existence of other being on Earth. You've seen that plants are intelligent. It's not only that they are intelligent, they are beings. They are actually being. And um, they're a good way to get started for us to recognize the existence of other beings on Earth. Um, this is what I do in my seminar. I bring people to develop a relationship with plants. It's nothing esoteric, it's nothing difficult to do. It has to do with just um, using, at first, just using our senses, just observing the plants, not only just passing by, um, touching, smelling, tasting, and you'll s you will realize a brand new world and a brand new way of relating to our world. Um, I think we have to get to know nature. That's the only way to develop the respect which is needed for us to go on and, not, and to stop destroying basically everything, including ourselves, like we're doing now. So I think it's something very important. Foraging is not just gathering plants for making nettle soup. Foraging is something very important. It raises consciousness, and it changes the way we look at the world. I believe that uh, postmodern living will be about cultivating, about living, living a, an urban life, but also gathering plants whenever we can, which is not always possible. But the thing is to live life with a hunter-gatherer spirit, which is made of respect for uh, everything that lives in the world. So to me, it's something that's been always normal. Living with the plants has always been normal. Um, eating wild plants was just as normal as um, eating cultivated plants because I started picking, gathering plants with my mother when I was two years old, I was 60 years ago. So um, it just was a normal thing to do. And when I when I was a teenager, I decided that living in society was not for me. It was, it was too much pressure. You know, I had a much easier time relating to plants than relating to people, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, now I've learned to relate to both. But still, I mean, <laughs> still, I mean plants, plants are nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. So... <laughs> <coughs> So one thing I had to find in order to be able to live away from society was to define my basic needs. And besides air to breathe, water to drink, then it was how to get food. And knowing that plants could feed me was easy enough, so I really dived into it, learned um, all the edible plants I could, and I took off to the woods. And I lived there for a number of years, um, especially in Western America, where you still have large woods. Uh, but then at one point, I, I was happy. I mean, I was happy, it was great. But at one point, I realized that, well, my, the, the, the place where I was living, I mean, even though I was going from place to place, the forest were all being destroyed. I mean, it was just very bad. I mean, I could go on living like this myself, but just for myself. And I decided, I decided I had to um, do something. So get out of the woods and pass on what I knew and, and get down to work. So that's when I started giving seminars, writing books, um, getting my PhD and starting a school and all of this. Um, and going around the whole planet to explore the relationship between people and plants. This is the job of an ethnobotanist, you know, kind of a hybrid between ethnologist and botanist. Um, basically, learning how people have been using plants, uh, you know, from, from the very beginning until now, and all over the planet, and it's just amazing, it's just enormous. And then at what point, chefs got into the picture, 
you know, the first one to introduce, to introduce me to the world of gastronomy with my wild plants was Michel Brass with his gargouillou, his gargouillou, the, the petit legume with a chickweed, was playing a leading role in it, and that was just mind blowing. Um, then that's, I worked very closely with Marc Vera, and we've been doing a lot of things together, writing books and doing TV series, and with other chefs in New York, in Switzerland, many places. And I believe it's, it's, it's boosted their creativity, which is very good. But this is not what's most, imp most important for me. For me, chefs have a crucial role to play in making things move forward in the world. Um, see, plants were forgotten because they got a very low social status, like I explained to you before. And now that's the way people look at plants. I mean, look down at plants. They despise plants. They crush plants. I mean, they, they, they eradicate them. They, 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 they kill them with chemicals and everything. They hate plants, basically. And it's, in my opinion, a cultural thing. So if it's cultural, we can change the culture and make things be different. And chefs, again, have a very important role because through the media, with all the... Um, the importance to, to given them, which is given to them, to, to the chefs. I mean, when they use plants and they show plants, and people start looking at these plants, these formerly despised plants, like something else. Plants become stars. And this is, this is great, this is very important. But um, anyway, um, I'd like to show you a few plants now. Um, here I classify the plants according to the way I did in this book, La Cuisine Sauvage, which is according to the part which is used. That's uh, um, a good way if you want to start using plants, knowing how to do it, which part to use and how. Because it's, we, I mean, there are so many, so many plants which nature offers us that we have to find our way around and have some kind of a, um, logic. So, you all know this. Acorns. Yeah, okay. Acorns. Um, they're one of the best source of um, glucids and proteins, carbohydrates and proteins, and they have been used extensively by um, our ancestors in Mesolithic time. Um, you find remnants of acorns all over the place, and acorns were the basic food of California Indians. Acorns contain tannins, so it has to be leached. When it's, once it's done, which is fairly easy to do with water, um, it's a great base for many things. So this was for um, mealy seeds. Now, oily seeds, we have um, corn poppy. Oh, it's OK. It should be in this direction. Um, Romans used to use the seeds for food, and they would even make oil out of it like people are still doing with the uh, opium poppy, which yields uh, a very good uh, oil, huile de yet. Then beech, beech nuts, they were used as oil, I mean, for yielding oil all over um, Central Europe. It's been going on pretty much until uh, World War II, and now it's totally forgotten. As far as roots go, um, this is pignut. It's, it's a small plant that grows in Western Europe, and the little tubers are just delicious. Very good, small, but excellent. And here we got rampion, rampion, and other related species. Some of them have been cultivated for their roots, but they're forgotten now. The roots are very uh, tasty, very uh, crisp, excellent. And this is, this, this is the survival plant. If you find this, if you're lost in the woods and you have to survive, try to find a patch of cattail. Because in the, in the underground rhizomes, you have pure starch that you can just eat like this. 
it will feed you. On top of it, you can eat the base of the leaves, you can eat the young um, flower spikes, you can eat the pollen, you can make a mat out of the leaves, you can make rope with the fibers of the rhizome. It's just uh, the supermarket of the, of the woods. <laughs> These are the roots of the cattail. So if you open this, there's a core of pure starch. Delicious. Linden leaves, young linden leaves, you can make salads. I mean, tons of salads. You could feed the whole of the city with the, the, the linden trees that grow here, you know? This is a weed. This is just hated by gardeners. It's one of the very best weed there is. It's gout weed. And the young plants are just the most perfect salad with a taste of celery and incense, and the older leaves, um, just a great vegetable. And uh, you can gather so much of it. I mean, it's really plentiful. You know, if people, sometimes people think that um, plants are just not easy to gather, that it's very tedious to, to get plants. Well, it's not always true. Same with plantain. It has a very nice mushroom flavor, very nice. And, well, this is again the best, um, best wild salad. It's um, perennial lettuce or blue lettuce. It's got a blue flower. It grows in rocks in a really dry environment. And it's just sweet, crisp, just excellent. And this is also the very best salad in the world. I mean, there are a lot of very best salads in the world, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> this one is not as common. It grows in the Mediterranean area. Uh, not far from the seashore, but I mean, it's so good. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, you know, the thing is, don't take my word for it. Go, go out there and um, and try it. Amaranth. This is a weed. I mean, it's, it was introduced as a vegetable, but it wasn't to the taste of the people, so it was forgotten. It's still with us. Comes from America. Still with us. If you have a, a garden, you have amaranth growing wild in there. That's for sure. And so, with Canopodium, it was introduced uh, in Roman times, or probably even with the first uh, um, cultivated plants. It's been with us since. It used to be um, used as a spinach, but as I said, it's too easy to grow, so it's been forgotten. Wild mustard, another weed in fields, um, with a very strong, very strong fragrance. And... Um, this is hedge mustard, another one. I mean, there could be so many. This one is particular because this one is amazing. That's one, it, it has a story. Um, it stinks, it stinks really like an old rag, very much so. And <laughs> this, is, this is what I thought um, until I was working with Marc Vera and we were talking together, you know, I was um, bringing here a lot of plants, including some which I thought were not really good, and he just crushed the leaf between his fingers, and at one point he told, wow, this is Bolitus mushroom, ça c'est du cep. And he made me uh, consommé de cep virtuel with that, it's amazing. I mean, it tastes of Bolitus, um, and there's no mushroom in it. This is another weed that comes from South America. Here it's totally unknown in, in South America and Colombia. It's part of the, um, the national dish Ajaco. Then we go on to uh, young stems, young shoots, young shoots, um, hops, which you can eat raw, and these ones um, they must be cooked. This is um, old man's beer, clematis. It grows all over the place. It grows all over the place, and nobody knows about using these plants, except in some parts of Italy, but it has to be cooked. This one is considered a toxic plant. You'll see it in all um, toxic plant books. Uh, it's briny, and okay, the, um, the fruits are toxic, but the young shoots are just delicious, excellent. Same with asparagus. You know, if you think of asparagus, you think of asparagus as, a, as an edible plant, but the fruits are to just toxic. Just the same as this one. And asparagus is good, but ah, this is even better, I think. <laughs> no, it's tr 
Try it. <laughs> Try it. Okay. Uh, this is mugwort. Mugwort is very, cho very um, chewy, but you can make fritters with it. It's very flavorful and got a lot of body to it. Black bryony. This is interesting because um, in southern France, southwestern France, um, there is a part of the population who is still very attached to the tradition of gathering this plant. And other people elsewhere just don't know it, although it grows all over Europe. Um, this is bath asparagus. This is a, a wild plant which has been met with more success. Um, it's grown, it, well, it's picked from the wild, but it's sold on markets in, in France and some other places. Um, this is cow parsnip or hogweed. I mean, it's a plant you can do everything with it, but the very best part is the young, the young stem. And inside this sheath um, uh, with, the, with the leaves, um, you have a young inflorescence, which is just like broccoli. It's excellent. Really, really very good. I can't understand why people don't know this plant. It's all over the world. I mean, at least all over Europe in pasture. There's just so much of it. And it's, and it's good. And it's reproductive. So is yeah. this burdock. Burdock is very common. And if you taste um, it's burdock it's stems, yeah. it tastes like it artichoke sick. hearts. Except that you do, all you have to do is cut the stem at the right stage, peel it, and eat it. That's it. Not even cooking it. It's just, well. Why do people not know that? So, a few, a few condiments. This is garlic mustard. It's mustard and garlic combined together. This is cuckoo flower or lady smock. It's very strong, extremely strong, extremely strong. And this is wood avens. Um, Mike told us about this plant um, yesterday. And you can see the root. The root smells like um, as he said about cloves, it smells like, but it's more than cloves. Uh, it has a lot of different, very subtle smells altogether. Not only cloves, it's one of the most beautiful um, um, wild condiment or condiment that I know of. And it's just all over the place. Again, grows all over. This one is not so common. It grows up in the mountains, but it smells like anise, except. Um, I don't know, it's more subtle, like anise or fennel. It's just more subtle, you know, not as strong as, um, as anise. Um, oregano. Oregano in northern countries doesn't smell very, very much. But I use the flowers to make a pesto. Pesto of wild oregano is something else. It's, it tastes slightly of oregano, but a lot more of mushroom, actually. It's, it has a... Interesting combination in itself. Some pickles. This is um, known in quite a few places in Europe, especially in the Mediterranean area. Um, Rocks have higher. Um, it's pickled. And it's very good. Lacto-fermentation. This is amaranth. It's a good way of preserving wild plants. It's not always that easy. It doesn't work always, but when you get down to it, it's really great. Um, and this, this is used, these are European olives, North Euro European olives. You can put them in brine um, and preserve them because they're very sour when you taste them like this. But after three weeks in brine, they're just very good. They're just um, excellent. Um, flowers, sweet violet. Not all violets are sweet. But um, um, they're all good. Queen of the Meadow, which has a great fragrance. And I'm done. Because it says, <laughs> so, so I don't want to. No, okay. well, thank you. Hi. 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 Hi.